Hey everybody, welcome to chapter eight, module eight, where we move to the resiliency model of family stress, adjustment, and adaptation. Notice the word resiliency. Now keep in mind that up until now, you've studied a lot about resiliency in families because this is kind of the new wave of thinking through social work. We don't just think about problems, but we think about strengths. We don't just think about maladaptation or poor adjustment. We think about how families adjust well. We think about how they thrive, what they build upon for success. So we want to consider resilience when it comes to stress management. Frankly, some families do better than others. And why is that? Because they are more resilient. They have resiliency baked in somehow to their, uh, to their adaptation. Okay. So with that, Let's move to the next slide as we talk about Weber's individuals and family stress and crisis, chapter eight. Okay, so this model is built, like many others, upon the Hill model, the double ABCX model, and the typology model. It emphasizes the post crisis adaptation phase. So remember, we come up to the X, and then what happens after the X is post-crisis. So this really focuses on adaptation post-crisis. It tries to explain, and does so to some degree, why some families are resilient and other families are vulnerable to crisis, why some families experience stress and move on without crisis and other families move into crisis. It also attempts to include cultural differences, things like family paradigms, how families are put together, family schemas, how families think, family coherence, how families work together. And essentially, this is a refinement on what we looked at in chapter in previous work in, in chapter um, seven, the typology model. So with that in mind, let's move into the model, the resilience model, a little bit more in depth. Ready? Here we go. Now, as with previous lectures, I am trying to connect you, connect all the pieces of these parts, pieces and parts of these diagrams to each other. And so here you'll see where I have drawn arrows from the A, V, T, B, C, P, S, C, and adjustment, bond and maladjustment, to where they are. So if you look at the A and go all the way to the far left, you'll see the stressor, A. The next piece is the V, the family's vulnerability. Remember, it's the pileup of stressors and strains and transitions, all the stuff that the family's going through that makes them vulnerable. Then we move to the T, which are the family patterns of functioning. You see the arrow over to the T, established patterns of functioning. Then you look at the B, now we're in this circle, so we're moving around the circle from established patterns of functioning down to the bottom to B, which are the family's resources, then to the PSC, which is the problem solving and coping, and then at the top, the stressor appraisal, or the, the um, way that the family looks at the stressor. Then the final piece on the far right is bond adjustment and maladjustment. Now, look at how these, the T, the B, the PSC, and the C, there's arrows going around to each of them. That's really important because you can see that uh, established patterns of functioning, encounter a stressor, uh, the family draws a problem it's, upon its problem solving and coping, which uh, requires them to draw upon their family resources, which leads them back to normal patterns of functioning. But it can go the other way too. So notice that the arrows can go either way around this circle. And then one piece in the middle <coughs> that's really important is the, um, the family themselves, uh, balance and harmony. And we'll get to that in a little bit more but notice that this model has at the top this square that says over time. So they're moving from left to right over time, from stressor all the way over to adjustment over time. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. The stressor. Now the stressor is basically the same as the A in the typology model. It includes both the stressor itself and the level of severity of the stressor, which means essentially the degree to which it threatens stability of the family, it disrupts the family's functioning, and or places demands 
that are larger than their capabilities to meet those demands or in excess of their capabilities. Next slide, please. The arrow here points over to vulnerability. See so that circle is around the V. So it's like the V in the typology model. It ranges from high to low, from high vulnerability to low vulnerability. It incorporates the notion of the pileup, right, of the stressors and the strains and the transitions that the family's making in the life cycle and in their lives. The demands partly shape the family's vulnerability. So if the demands are higher than their capacity, then they are more vulnerable. And then this interacts with the T, which is the next thing we'll turn to, or established patterns of functioning. So the stressor takes into account the vulnerability of the family. The family has certain ways of functioning to which we turn to next. Okay, I've drawn a line from the T over to the circle that's around established patterns of functioning. See that? It's a lot like the T in the typology model. It recognizes um, regenerative, resilient, rhythmic, and traditionalistic families, kind of like we saw before. And it interacts with the family's resistance resources, which is at the bottom there. You see that, that B down there? So we haven't gotten there yet. But, uh, so these are the established patterns of function. Every family has certain ways of doing things. When they encounter stressors, they do certain things. They, that's their established pattern of functioning. Sometimes that really works well, and sometimes it doesn't. That's where we step in. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Here is the B, the family's resources. So notice the arrow goes down and there's a circle around the B family resources. It's a lot like the B in the typology model. So you see where this is kind of following the typology model, right? Adjustment requires resistance resources or family protective factors. The family struggles when they encounter stress to maintain their family integrity, to hold themselves together and to function. It requires a degree of what we call elasticity or plasticity. That's the ability to flex so that here they are at risk and they're experiencing the stressor, but they have to flex and adapt to function and then to complete the, the tasks such as the developmental tasks necessary to get through this stressor uh, to keep it from coming, becoming maladjustment. Now this interacts with the family appraisal of the stressor, which is the C to which we turn next. Okay, draw in a circle around family stressor and an arrow over to it so you can see where it is on the diagram. It's a lot like the C in the typology model. The family evaluates the seriousness of the stressor using their kind of mental schema, right? They evaluate the hardship that it's causing them. Um, the stressor is obviously taxing some of their resources, so they're kind of evaluating that hardship. And they determine whether it's a temporary setback, no big deal, or a catastrophe, oh my God, this is horrible, right? And so the same stressor, hardship, could be catastrophic to one family and just a, you know, a setback for another family. Now this interacts with the PSC or the family's problem solving and coping strategies to which we will turn next. Here's the arrow over to the circle, PSC. Now let's think about the PSC for a moment. It's a lot like the PSC in the typology model. It includes the family's ability to define the stressor, whether it's manageable or not. It includes the identification of alternative courses of action they can take, steps to resolve any interpersonal issues that are taking place stressing the family, and then some appraisal or you know, figuring out how to, to resolve the problem and whether it resolves itself or not. If it doesn't resolve itself, that would be cause for maladjustment. If it does, their resources are sufficient, you know, their definition, their resources, and their patterns of functioning are sufficient to address this stress, then they move on to bond adjustment. So coping behaviors could include things like um, maintaining or strengthening the family, 
it could be uh, maintaining emotional stability in the face of, you know, some pretty significant upset. It could include using resources, calling upon internal resources, things they have, or external resources where they're provided by uh, outside. And it could mean kind of resolving the hardship so that they return to homeostasis and normalcy. Next slide, please. Adjustment then refers to the outcome of the adjustment process. Now, you'll notice that the arrow here is pointing to the family in the middle and up the top you've got bond adjustment, at the bottom you've got maladjustment. Bond adjustment is when the family achieves balance and harmony. Now notice in the middle of the circle over here what we mean by balance and harmony. We mean developmental well-being. We mean solid spirituality. We mean relationships with the community and relationships with the natural world around them. We mean structure, how the family structures itself and how well it functions. And we also mean inter personal relationships. So for a family to achieve bond adjustment, good adjustment, they would need balance and harmony. They want to be achieving all the de developmental tasks, the Ericksonian, Piaget, Kohlberg, etc. developmental tasks. They also want to have a sense of spirituality, that there's something about their family that's bigger than just, you know, atoms and matter, but there's something uh, more going on there. They want to have good relationships connected to the community. They want to feel good about their natural world, and that's hard to do. For example, if you're in the Philippines and, and you're being raised in a dump, there's a, an entire community called Smoky Mountain in Manila where people live, literally live in the dump. The dump is on fire, uh, and so it's called Smoky Mountain because it's always smoking because there's always things burning underneath the surface. And so the families live in the stench and the filth and the smoke in little shacks and they scavenge from the from the dump and they sell it to the community they hustle you know to make money so that would be a relationship with nature other people live next to a power plant or next to a sewer station where it smells bad right and then other people live in tree-lined streets um, and they live in nice houses and kind of the world is their oyster so that's a relationship with nature uh, structure and function, if a family structured well, in other words, the parents know who they are, the kids know who they are, and everybody's kind of in balance and in harmony, and they've got great relationships with the extended family, and that doesn't, you know, their extended family's not intruding on the nuclear family, and the family's functioning well, the children are doing their chores, parents are working well, there's not mental illness, there's not alcoholism, um, there's enough money coming in, enough resources to survive, so that everybody's functioning well the house is maintained, those kinds of things. And then interpersonal relationships. I mean, it's really hard to cope with stress when everybody in the family hates each other. A functioning family or a well-adjusted, bond-adjusted family would be a family that has really strong interpersonal relationships. Now, in the next slide, let's explore maladjustment a little bit. So let's move on. Again, adjustment refers to the outcome of the adjustment phase, what happens when they go from stressor A, you account for their vulnerability, you look at the four issues of the established patterns, family resources, the appraisal of the stressor, and the problem solving and coping, and then you come to this last phase, um, how are they adjusting? Now, bond adjustment, if it's balance and harmony, maladjustment would be defined as the opposite. It would be a lack of well-being a lack of spirituality, just kind of a sense of we're just, just, just the world is all there is and we're just going to get through it however the hell we got to do to get through it, right? Um, there's poor relationships with the community. They're disconnected from the community at large. They're not, you know, they're disconnected from nature. Um, they are not structured well. Uh, kids are telling parents what to do and parents aren't getting along with each other and, uh, you know, outside forces are acting on the family and um, you can't tell who's in the family and who's outside of the family, so they're not structured well. They don't function well. Nobody's doing what they need to do to make the family function, make the family work, and so it's kind of falling apart internally. 
uh, as they respond to stress. Everybody kind of retreats to their own world and does their own thing. And there's a lot of tension and stress in the relationships. So this poor interpersonal relationships. So this is the adjustment phase. Now, let's move to the next part of the, of the, um, of the resiliency model, and that is the adaptation phase. Remember, there's adjustment, bond adjustment and maladjustment. And then once they've adjusted or not, then they move into the adaptation phase. If they've adjusted well, then they don't really need to go into adaptation. If they haven't adjusted well, then they have to adapt. So let's move on to adaptation. Okay, here's the adaptation model. Now it looks a little complicated, but we'll work through it. It's a lot like the models we've seen thus far with a few things included. You notice you've got the, the um, balance and harmony in the middle there. And so rather than try to tackle this model here, let's just consider that it goes from the stressor on the left, which is could be the crisis, right? All the way on the right to uh, bond adaptation or maladaptation. So let's go through these elements one by one. This model adds several factors to the typology model. And so I've got arrows pointing to each of these factors so that we can kind of figure out what they are. Um, one of the things that this model considers is inadequate and or uh, inadequate functioning and or deterioration in the functioning of a family. So they may are inadequate. They may not have been functioning in the first place and that's why this why they're in the adaptation phase, that's why they went to maladjustment, or the stressor may have disrupted their harmony and now they've deteriorated. So that would be the first T. The second T is considered to be retained patterns of function. These are things that they're gonna keep. The way they functioned in the past that work, they're gonna hold on to those. Another T is restored patterns of function. And these are patterns of functioning that they once used, but kind of fell out of favor, and now they want to restore them. And then the other T would be uh, newly instituted patterns of function. So maybe they've come to you as a family therapist, and you've helped them kind of put in some new patterns of functioning to help them get through this crisis. So that would be newly instituted patterns of functioning. Now, look at that arrow that points to the CCC, which is up at the top, or the CCCC, four C's. That stands for coherence. Now, in this coherence model, we are looking at um, things like their schema. Uh, their, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's just talk about coherence for a moment. Coherence is their ability to, to understand what's really going on and make sense of this. Schema, the five C's, is their worldview. And then paradigms are their ways of understanding what's happening to them. Um, you know, a, a, a worldview would be, for example, uh, there's a God and he's in charge of the world and he won't let me handle, he won't give me more than I can handle. Or another worldview would be, uh, you know, material is all there is, atoms and um, ions and uh, anions and flesh and bones and dust, right? And there is no higher power. And so, um, so I have no God upon which to rely. We've got to do this ourselves. That would be two examples of worldviews. Um, and so a schema would be a worldview where a paradigm would be, um, you know, our family in the face of crisis pulls together and fights through it. Or, um, oh my God, why do these things keep happening to us? It's not fair. We can't handle one more thing. So that would be an example of a paradigm. So this model adds these factors to the typology model to expand upon it a little bit. Next slide, please. Now, let's talk about the T's for a minute. The T's uh, could be inadequate. The first T is inadequate and or deterioration in the family's patterns of function. So um, the family's previously stabilized patterns of functioning may have been inadequate already. They may have not been a, a solid family that was working well together and there was a lot of internal tension and stress and difficulty. And so they were already prone to destabilization. They were inadequate in the, in the first place. Or it could be that they um, 
experienced this crisis and everything just kind of fell apart for them. The family fell apart. And so they, their functioning deteriorated. When you think about their functioning, you want to think about that in terms of the pile up of demands, right? So all these demands have piled up on them and they've begun to fall apart. Next slide, please. Or let me say before we go to the next slide, they either fell apart or um, they weren't functioning in the first place, right? And so they weren't ready for the stress that they encountered. Next slide. The double A, so notice the arrow pointing over to the double A, is the pileup of demands. And this is like the double A in the typology model um, of the adaptation phase. This pileup of demands, all these things that they have to do to make life work, interacts with the crisis. Um, next slide, please. Which brings us to the X or the maladjustment, the crisis, right? So if they were well adjusted, they wouldn't have reached the crisis stage. They'd have, they'd have, uh, a bond adjustment would have led them to, um, to uh, kind of functioning as they were before the stressor, but their maladjustment led them to this adaptation phase. So maladjustment is the crisis situation in this model. It's like the X factor of the typology model, uh, of the adaptation phase of the typology model, uh, very similar, All right? So the family is not functioning, they're in crisis, let's move on. Now we need to think about the patterns of functioning. We've got three patterns of functioning here uh, in, this, in these three circles. So I've drawn a big circle around all three to show you what I'm talking about. Now, they're if they're retained patterns of functioning, what they did before the crisis would be the things that stay the same. Restored patterns of functioning would be that a family changes in response to the crisis, but eventually returns to the pre-crisis patterns of functioning. And then the double T or newly instituted patterns means that a family changes and maintains the change after the crisis. So this is a family that is has struggled and they've made some changes. They're going to hold on to those changes and then move into this next this next piece. Okay, let's move on then to talk about family resources, which is at the bottom of this diagram. Ready? Here we go. See the arrow pointing down to the bottom. It's from BB down to the bottom. That's the big circle. And then inside that circle are several smaller circles. So I'm going to take these in pieces. But BB overall stands for the family's resources, the recovery factors. It's what the family has at their disposal to respond to the pile of demands, to the stressors, to respond to this maladjustment. It's like the BB and the triple B factors in the typology model. Adaptation in this model uh, involves regenerative recovery factors, PRF, to facilitate their ability to bounce back from what's it, what they're facing. So regenerative means to regenerate their energy, to, to push forward. Recovery means their ability to adapt and move on. There's four types of resources. There's social supports. That would be like neighbors or friends. There's kin support. That would be like extended family, uh, aunts, uncles, uh, mother, father, uh, you know, people in the, the family kinship network. Uh, I suppose that also could include uh, fictive kin. So by fictive kin, I mean, um, my I have a bunch of kids that I have no blood relation to that call me Uncle Kevin and my wife, Aunt Sandy. Now, we have no relationship with them, but we are so close to their families that they consider us aunts and uncles. So that's fictive kin. You, you know what I'm talking about. You've got people that are like other moms and dads aunts and uncles that are not inside of, of your blood relations, but are like kin supports. There's also community supports, church, work, clubs, um, community centers, those kinds of things. And then of course, family support, which is what's going on inside the family, the ability of the family to support each other. So these are the resources that they're drawing upon to manage this crisis. Next slide, please. Now, the double C, you see where the arrow is pointing to the very top here. That's the, um, the uh, situational appraisal or the 
families looking at the situation and trying to make sense of what's going on. It's like the CC in the typology model and the little c, big C in the far model. Now influences upon their ability to appraise the situation includes paradigms, the ways they have of looking at crisis and thinking through it, what paradigms exist for them. Now keep in mind, some families have very limited paradigms. They just don't know what to do in crisis. Um, other families have you know, more expansive paradigms. They've been through crisis before and they know they're gonna make it through, but this one's pretty big. And so it's, they're kind of in a stage of, of maladjustment right now and trying to figure out how to adapt to it. It is also coherence. I mean, sometimes a crisis just doesn't make sense, right? We had, um, when, when I was uh, doing community work, in the Hollygrove neighborhood, one day somebody went to steal a car and two of my AmeriCorps members who were living in my community center caught them in the act and one of them chased him across Airline Highway into uh, another part of the neighborhood and down a dark street to a dead end, at which point the guy he was chasing pulls out a gun and shoots him twice, once in the hand and once in the gut. Well, that was a huge crisis for me as the executive director, for all the people that were part of my AmeriCorps program, uh, for my family, because it was impacting me deeply, right? I was staying at the hospital overnight, making sure this guy was okay. We, you know, we were calling upon all of our, our help to kind of think through this thing, but it just didn't make sense. It just was something that kind of rocked our world a little bit. And so um, the the stressor, if it had been a financial stressor, which I'd been through a thousand times running a community center, I would have been able to handle that. But this was a new kind of stressor that didn't make much sense to me. And then a schema is, you know, the family's worldview or their way of thinking through things in the meta in the meta world. Is there a God? How does God help me deal with this? Or uh, is nature handing me some difficult tasks? Or you know, this is our, our overall meta worldview. So the personal paradigms of how to deal with stress, the coherence of the stress, does it make sense to us? I mean, it makes sense to somebody, but maybe not to us. And then our schema, our worldview, all come together to help us appraise the situation and figure out what to do. Next slide, please. Okay, now we turn to the situational appraisal. So the family's looking at the situation and trying to make sense of it. And in this model, there's kind of three ways that they, uh, three things that they use to make the situational appraisal. The first is paradise. And uh, the coherence, as you'll see in a second, which we'll talk about next, influences paradigms. Um, paradigms are the family's views on life, on the situation and life in general, their expectations, what they think should happen in the world, and then their patterns of functioning in various areas, such as child rearing, who raises the children, um, work, who goes to work, education, how valued is education. And these things vary by culture. And what do I mean by vary by culture? Well, let's think of, of one example. In New Orleans, when we walk down the street, uh, at least the neighborhood I'm from, I grew up in a neighborhood called Holly Grove, and it, I was taught as a child that you say hi to everybody you meet. And so you may it's not a big exchange, but you're walking down the street, somebody's walking towards you on the sidewalk, and you say, hey, how you doing? And, or good afternoon, good morning, good evening, a good night. And, and they say to you, hey, how are you? Good evening. It, it's just a simple greeting. It's not a big complicated thing. It's just people acknowledge each other that we're real, uh, that we matter to each other, that we're interconnected. Sometimes I'll be walking down Carrollton Avenue and I encounter somebody like a Tulane professor or a Tulane student um, who's from out of town. I say, hey, how you doing? And they'll look at me like, why are you talking to me? Who, 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 I don't know you. Or when I went to the Northeast to work uh, as a dean of a school in Philadelphia, I would try to make conversation with people because I was new to the area, didn't know anybody. And I'd say, hey, how you doing? And people would look at me like, what, well, you want my money? What do you want from me? Why are you talking to me? Because people in the Northeast are not like that. So that would be a cultural piece that we use to make sense of things. And when I say hi to somebody, and they don't say hi back, I either think what's wrong with them or do I have a booger hanging from my nose or do I look like I'm about to steal their money, right? I mean, I kind of wonder what's going on here. So it kind of 
my paradigm is, my cultural paradigm is that people should speak to each other. Uh, another cultural paradigm is that when um, people have money, they should share it with, with other people. So um, I remember when I was a teen, I didn't completely understand this, and I had some money in my pocket, and I went to Burger King, and I had two friends with me, and I had enough money for me to get a big Coke and for them to get small Cokes, and so I ordered two small Cokes and a big Coke, and they're like, what, you think you're better than us? Why, why don't we all get the same thing? And it was kind of a cultural faux pas that I committed, right? Uh, so cultural paradigms are slightly different between different cultures. That's a unique feature of this model. Now, let's move on then to talk about coherence. We're still talking about situational appraisal, so that top circle. i got a circle around all three of those things. So coherence is the worldview that expresses the family's sense of order. It's the cognitive basis. It's how this family thinks about the world. How they think about the world, therefore, impacts what they consider to be a way of coping with this situation. So some families, a teenage daughter gets pregnant. Their kind of worldview says, get an abortion. Other families would never consider getting an abortion, would never consider adoption. Yeah, it's a hardship, but we're going to have this baby and Frank will raise it as a family. It takes a village to raise a child. So she may only be 13, 14 years old, but doggone it, we're going to take care of this baby. That would be an example of a view. Um, ex, uh, ex, uh, 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 a worldview that kind of helps the family make sense of things. It's their mental, mental um mental basis for making a decision about how to apply resources or what resources to apply or understanding resources as a whole. How do we apply resources to the situation? Worldview determines how a family views a crisis and the family schema influences its coherence. So now let's move on to family schema, kind of moving backwards, right? Still on situational appraisal, the top circle, the schema or five C's is the sense of shared values, beliefs, and expectations the family has. It's their way of understanding family structure. How I am oriented to the group, how the self and the group are oriented to each other. I'm reading a book right now by Trevor Noah, who grew up in South Africa during apartheid. The book is called Born a Crime because it was a crime for a white father to um, to procreate with a black mother and have a mixed race child. And so he was born a crime. Um, and so he always viewed himself as kind of a strange feature of South African society. He never felt like he fit in with the black folks. He didn't fit in with the white folks. And even the mixed folks he didn't fit in with very well. Um, and so he just didn't know where he belonged. That would be an example of self-group orientation. Spiritual beliefs certainly would be part of schema, how we view you know, kind of the, the world beyond ourselves. Um, and, and by the way, as you remember, spiritual does not mean religious. So when we say spiritual, it could be somebody that just believes that there's something bigger than myself, that nature is bigger than myself that the world as a whole is like kind of operating according to laws, the laws of nature, the laws of science. But it, it could also be a religious belief. Um, you could believe that Allah has, um, because you are committed to serving Allah, that Allah is going to um, give you justice. It could be the belief in uh, Yahweh God, the Jehovah God, that, uh, that God He's going to take care of his people, and I am his people, and so he's going to take care of our family. So spiritual beliefs impact that. The thoughts about land and nature. Um, you know, you go some places in the world, and there's not a lick of trash on the ground. There's beautiful trees and plants growing. And then you go in other neighborhoods, and there's no trees. There's trash on the ground. Um, you know, the, the place is not taken care of. And so there's kind of beliefs about land and nature a part of that scheme and how the land and nature are supposed to treat us. And then time orientation. Um, it's really interesting that in certain societies, like Western societies, we operate by the clock. 
And so if we say five o'clock, we mean five o'clock. Whereas in other societies, like in Arab cultures, five o'clock may mean 5.30, it may mean six o'clock, it means you know sometime around five-ish. And um, so if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But eventually they'll get there, right? So that's a, an example of time orientation and how things should work according to the clock, which certainly would impact stress, right? So if I believe that I, if I believe that I should be five minutes early for a five o'clock meeting, and I'm running five minutes late, I would be stressed. On the other hand, if I believe that I should, you know, arrive at five-ish, then I wouldn't be so stressed if I'm a few minutes late. My wife and I um, have sometimes conflict about this. I, especially when it comes to going to church, I, I don't like walking to church late. I was a pastor's kid, and when we walked in late, everybody looked at us like, hmm, pastor's family coming in late, can't get their act together. Um, and it was always stressful and tense when we walked into church late. So I like to get there early. My wife, on the other hand, is like, well, we'll get there when we get there. And so she's just kind of relaxed about time, and she doesn't mind walking in five, ten minutes late. Um, so, you know, I'll be, like, waiting for her to get ready, to get ready, to get ready, and, and I'll be sitting at the door, like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so there's tension between us sometimes around that issue. That's a time orientation issue. And all of these things are influenced by problem solving and coping, to which we will turn next. Okay, so the PSC stands for problem solving and coping. Now we've encountered this before in the typology model, right? Problem solving, the family's ability to define the stressor as manageable, to identify alternative courses of action, to initiate steps to take action, to resolve issues, and then to resolve the problem. So it sounds like the problem solving method almost, doesn't it? You define it, you develop alternatives, you implement one or more of those alternatives and you fix a problem. Coping is a family's ability to maintain or strengthen family, to maintain emotional stability or well-being of the family members in the process, to obtain, to get new resources or to use existing resources, and then to initiate efforts to resolve hardships. So these are the family's problem solving and coping capabilities. Now, if all of those things are working, they adapt. If not, maladaptation will move to that uh, soon. So, family adaptation. Bond adaptation, as we've talked about, is not balance, but it's balance and harmony in the family's development. It's a sense of well being, spirituality, good relations with the community, with nature, structure, and function and interpersonal relationships. Notice how the wheel in the middle, just to the left of family adaptation, the double X, has balance and harmony in it. And all these issues, all these uh, pieces, you know, the, the family's uh, well-being and spirituality, community relations, nature, with nature, their structure uh, and function and interpersonal relationships, if all those things are going well, they, that would lead to bond ad adaptation. The family uh, adapts to the crisis well and draws upon resources and rearranges itself in, in you know, structurally in good ways and then can begin to redefine the stressor as less of a catastrophe and more of a temporary setback that we're going to get through. And all these pieces begin to happen, draw upon their resources, all those pieces begin to happen, then they're, they move back into the adjustment phase, they're fine. If they don't, they are in crisis, they return to crisis. Next slide, please. So now I've got the two phases side by side, the adjustment phase, the adaptation phase. And I'm sorry you can't quite see these because I've got my, um, my talking head in front of the adaptation phase. But what I want you to see is how adaptation over time, uh, if the family adjusts, they don't have to move into, or adjustment, they don't have, if they adjust, they don't have to move into adaptation because they've adjusted quickly to the crisis. If, on the other hand, they are not well adjusted and they cannot draw upon resources, they uh, see the stressor as catastrophic, their problem solving and coping strategies are not enough, uh, their established patterns of functioning are insufficient, and they don't have the family resources, internal or external, you know, uh, to their nuclear family but or, and or from the, the larger kinship network, then they can move into maladjustment. 
they're maladjusted and they may move over into the adaptation phase and go through a similar process until they kind of readjust or readapt, I'm sorry, readapt their family uh, to the crisis itself. Now they don't have to go into crisis. The stressor, they can adjust to it and not go into crisis. But if they do go into crisis, then they've got to adapt to the crisis, moving through each of these pieces, as you can see on the right, as we've discussed. So what's interesting about this model is it adds a little bit of culture to the overall thinking, right? Um, and then it helps you think a little bit about um, how families have pre-existing ways of coping and pre-existing uh, resources, how they can um, change for a while and then go back to the way they were, change for a while, make those changes permanent. And then how we as helpers or people in their lives can help them create newly instituted patterns of functioning. Now, sometimes those patterns of functioning are things like divorce, right? And um, there's a very stressful marriage and they're constantly in crisis and they divorce and the two parents um, have to have to kind of reestablish or adapt to a new normal. And sometimes it's that the family reorganizes itself itself in ways that are more functional. In family therapy, we often talk about uniting the marriage team to be a good parenting team. And we would say things like good, a good marriage makes for good parents. If the parents are always fighting, always arguing, and the kids are fighting and arguing in, in crisis, the kids are choosing between one parent or the other, and there's all sorts of chaos going inside the family. If the parents are united, can work together well, can make rules together, can share rules, can share responsibilities, then the family is more harmonious, right? And so these factors are important to helping a family adjust to crisis. If we can help a family reorganize itself, kind of moving tasks around, for example, if, if mom is working two jobs and going to school and then coming home and trying to, to um, clean the house and parent the kids, and the father is going to work and um, then he's working a second job and he's coming home and having a few beers and just wants to watch sports on the TV and the mom's frustrated and she's angry at him and he's like, why are you always on my back? I'm working two jobs too and there's constant stress and the kids are just responding to this as chaos. So if we can help the family begin to readjust, maybe this daughter can help you clean the house and this son can help you rake the yard and maybe you could wash dishes if she cooks and so on and so forth. You can arrange things in the family so that they respond better as a family unit. Then when new stresses come, they don't have to go into the adaptation phase because they've, the, yeah, they've already adapted. So then they can better adjust temporary stressors. Okay, I hope that makes sense. We're going to build upon this a little bit in module nine. So don't, if you're a little bit lost, don't be. These are all theoretical models. And by the time we get to chapter 11, which is where you're going to be really excited because that's when we talk about what to do. And that's frankly why I've given two weeks to module 11. For now, we're still kind of working through the theoretical models, moving from the past, from the 1950s, right? all the way up to the present. And we're gonna get a little bit farther in the next module when we look at more kind of family therapy-ish type techniques. So uh, module nine will be a little bit more uh, from the kind of family systems world. Module 10, we will look at the, the historical and um, theoretical components of formal crisis management. And then chapter 11, we'll talk about how to help a family manage a crisis and what you do with each member of the family. Meanwhile, what I want you to do next is take the quiz on module eight and then move through the elements of the module, taking quizzes where appropriate, then move to the discussion board. I've also included, as you can see at the very bottom, this um, PowerPoint without my narration to kind of help you see the PowerPoint and to know what's important for the, um, for the final exam. You also wanna be thinking about your paper coming up um, because it's coming up in modules 10 and 11 we want to submit that by the end of April. So you want to be thinking about that right now, right? What you want to write about. If you need some consultation, feel free to email me or contact me by uh, phone. I really want to be helpful. Remember also that you want to first post to the discussion board by Wednesday. 
And then by Saturday at 11.59 p.m., you want to have responded to at least three of your, your peers' posts. All right, enough said on this, the adaptation and adjustment phases of the, uh, the, uh, the resiliency model, of the adaptation and adjustment phases of this model. I hope this model was helpful to you to understanding a little bit more about how families function in crisis and what we can do to help them function. Uh, but for now, uh, let's, uh, let's move on to the next pieces. Um, take care and thank you for being part of my class.